So for my project, what I wanted to do was build a spring-gauge displacement transducer, and I've got all the components that kind of went into it up here, and we're just going to walk through a little bit of the transformation from the design on the left here over to what ultimately came about on the right. So the problem that we have, at least with some of my stuff in the lab, is this is the pressure vessel, this is where I run my samples in the middle here, and what we use are DCDTs on the outside and then an internal elevator DC here. This connects to a plate, that connects to that plate, which then leaves me basically a buffer of a lot of metal in between the actual sample and where we actually do the recording. So here's where the elevator DC would record. So what I want to try to do is see, can we get a more direct measurement on the sample itself? Can we get tighter to the sample? So maybe, because we know as we shear that we start to tilt a little bit, and if that's being recorded in our DCDT as opposed to the actual dilation or compaction of the sample, then that's an issue. Additionally, you know, if possible, you can see it's a little crowded in there. Uh, we would like to free up some space if at all possible, particularly on the edges where this is now blocking two plates because we have all of the acoustic wires. So that was the initial thought driving what we're doing here. So in order to solve that, we're gonna go through a couple steps. Uh, we wanted to look at a mechanical part, electrical and programming part. Mechanical was honestly pretty easy. So what we did first was, you know, courtesy of this class project, just printed a series of you know, 3D printed parts. Not very tricky, but this at least allowed us to get an idea of sizing, make sure that everything would fit, everything would work before we then you know, spent the money to get the machine shop to try and actually get the metal parts in. So we wanted to employ a diamond design, and that is you know, pretty much exactly similar to the Wheatstone bridge, so that we could use that Wheatstone bridge. It just makes it a lot easier when we then have, are able to use the Wheatstone bridge, the full bridge, to be able to balance the two parallel aspects of the resistors. So that way we can actually get an accurate reading, hopefully without too much complexity with it. Uh, the prototype that we built is just a larger bit, so it's uh, larger than we would use in that pressure vessel, and that's largely just because string gauges that we have are larger and they get more expensive as we want higher measurements. So we want to make sure that all this is going to work before we downsize everything. So that's why the 3D printed parts, as well as the final part, are for a larger design, and that's actually to be used for gouge samples in the biax, so outside of the pressure vessel. So still has some use, but a larger size. And the high elastic deal point is just so that if we're going to put it in the biax, you know, I can't use the plastic parts because they'll bend, they'll snap. It's no good. So what I wound up using was aluminum alloy, uh, was 50 52 with an elastic yield point of 30 MPa. So good enough for some of the lower stress that I do. Because in the pressure vessel, we rarely go above 20. So should be fine because we need it to be able to deform so we can measure strain, but not so much as a break. As I mentioned for the electrical part, using the Wheatstone bridge, uh, really um, probably about the simplest circuit that we could really build for this, just because we have the two parallel aspects and we can balance out the voltages. So that one's pretty straightforward. Uh, signal amplification as well, because the signal that we get directly out uh, is rather small in millivolts, and we just want to be able to get a larger signal that we can see, record, and if we could get a decent signal amplification, then we should be able to calibrate this but that's only assuming that we can really differentiate the noise level from our actual signal. Programming, uh, just made use of the Arduino, and that's a real simple circuit, I'll have a picture of it later, but really all that is, is as we've seen before, when we looked at strain gauges, we just have our amplifier here, we have a capacitor, and a couple of resistors, nothing really tricky. So we just send our initial voltage in through the amplifier, signal is then amplified, and then we use the capacitor as well to make sure that we're not overloading anything, so that's all we do. The general workflow was just to start at the 3D print stage, because that's what we were able to do relatively quickly. I probably had the highest turnaround of any of this, because, well, that one's based off of how fast they can 3D print, normally about a day. Bench testing takes me a while, so that's slower, and then programming also takes me a while, so that's slower. So bench testing, that's the actual design, and really it's what you may expect. So we have our basically four bracket pieces which just allow for the connection. And here and here are set, so you screw those in at the angle that you want. And then 
these have basically a slide bar. So I built that just so that should you then need to change the size of your sample, you know, whether it compacts and you need to reset it, then you can really just squeeze it in or back out. That way it allows you a little bit more of a range of where you can use this. And then again, you can just tighten it down. So that way you can basically, it's like resetting a DCDT, you can reset this wherever you need to. So hopefully it has a little bit more functionality than just one set point. So that way you can do a couple designs. Programming, as I mentioned, pretty straightforward. Uh, the amplifier is the one that we used in class as well, so that was provided courtesy of this class, as were the resistors and capacitors. So nothing here was very expensive. The metal here itself cost about mm, six to ten bucks. The, what took the longest and cost the most was actually just getting that machine, because that was used by Waterjet, just to make sure it's the easiest way to cut out a big a metal plate, and also to make sure that we actually have the right diameters for the screws to fit through, because I found that when I did 3D printing, it was the same design that I built in Onshape, but when I 3D printed it, the holes wound up closing up a little bit. I assume just a little bit of the heat transfer there, probably tighten that up. So I want to make sure that with water jet, that wouldn't happen. So that way it actually fits in, works as it should. So the results, the first test looked really bad. So basically we had just a lot of noise when that was first going, and I wasn't quite sure what's happening. So that just took a little bit of troubleshooting in order to tear down where the connection might not have been real good. Uh, so that was actually the ground connection on the side, but that took a little resoldering and actually just replacing those wires. Really not too bad. So that then eventually gave us the signal down here, which is differentiable from the noise. However, it's still pretty noisy and it's still pretty hard to maintain at a constant level, even where we were trying to. So what I did was put this in the vise, and then from there you could either crank the uh, vise or just rip the sides. And to maintain a kind of constant level, you still have all these spikes, and realistically, in the future, can employ some filtering to maybe to help that. But there's other suggestions I have for that, of how that will work. This is just simple bench testing. You can see top right, we're changing the voltage, and it works. So <laughs> that's Really all that we aimed to do was to build a working prototype so that way in the future we can improve it. And the way we want to improve, improve it first is it's still a little noisy for calibration. So I think the first way to fix that, priority one would probably be new strain gauges because these are, these are not ideal. So they're a little bit old, which in and of itself, not so much a problem. But they're actually just not very sensitive. So the amount of basically I don't know what you want to call that, wrapping or double backing that the wire does, so then it's more sensitive to strain itself. Uh, that's, there's not a lot of it on these. So if we got more sensitive strain gauges, I think we would get a bit, of, uh, bet, a bit of a better signal. And as well as perhaps a more powerful amplifier, Michael, just so that we can really split that out. Additionally, I think post-processing we could filter, and I think filtering would again help the signal. So ultimately what we want, have wanted to do was after we invent our trim ray, then we can put this down in a pressure vessel, we just make it smaller, so that way we can use that in the pressure vessel. And that's the idea. So right now it is built to fit on the gallon material blocks. So that way, see it screws right into the side shields and it bolts down all the way so there's no gap in between. So it could easily be utilized, but given how noisy this was, it wasn't great for being able to calibrate it and made an attempt, but not so smooth. So that's where I think in the future, <coughs> we'll this one. and yeah, I guess if you guys have any questions, that's really what the project's about. So, So for oil pressure, I would expect not. I would expect we would need to find a way to protect that a little bit better than tape. But really, that shouldn't be so hard to just make a watertight seal now. That's what we do with everything else in the pressure vessel, so we could lightly jacket it. And what I was hoping to do, actually, by in the pressure vessel, was just allows it to then flex and really just kind of scissor in and out.